Blackstone Audio presents Berlin Diary, the Journal of a Foreign Correspondent, 1934 to 1941, by William L. Shirer. To Tess, who shared so much. Forward to the John Hopkins edition. At the end of the 1930s, the New Yorker published a cartoon by James Thurber, showing a woman looking up from a newspaper and asking her husband, Who is this Hitler, and what does he want? It would be difficult to think of a more appropriate comment on the end of American innocence, when a people who for two decades had shown itself indifferent to what went on in the outside world began to wonder whether such willful ignorance might not have a price. William L. Shirer's Berlin Diary, which was published sixty years ago, as the world trembled on the verge of World War II, was in a sense an answer to that question, as well as to the one posed by Thurber's curious reader. Written amid the rush of events, it sorted them out and showed how they contributed to the perilous crisis that confronted the Western world, and its considerable success with readers was testimony to a new awareness and readiness to face up to reality. William L. Shirer's long career in journalism began in 1925, when he went to Paris after the completion of his college education and became a correspondent for the Chicago Tribune, being transferred to Vienna in 1929 to become chief of the Tribune's European Bureau. In 1932, on vacation in Switzerland, he lost an eye in a skiing accident, and this necessitated a long recovery, most of which took place in Spain. In 1934, a new violence entered European politics, with the February riots in Paris that toppled Daladier, Dolphus's armed attack upon the socialists in Vienna, and the Night of Long Knives in Germany, when Hitler came to terms with his rebellious brown shirts. Shirer was back in Paris this year as European correspondent for the New York Herald Tribune. The following year he went to Berlin as correspondent for Hearst's Universal News Service, which was disbanded in 1937, briefly leaving him without a position. In the same year, however, Edward R. Murrow, chief of the CBS Bureau in London, invited him to open an office in Vienna, and he entered upon the broadcasting career that lasted until his severing of relations with CBS in 1947, six years after his return to the United States. Shira's European broadcasts, elaborated from his notebooks, since official censorship would not allow certain things to be said on the air, formed the substance of his diary. Readers of this new edition must remember the peculiar pressures under which he worked and wrote, and they must remind themselves constantly that he was writing in medius rebus about issues that were still unresolved and questions that had not yet been answered. Because history has now filled out the story and supplied what was missing in 1941, today's readers know more than Shira did when he wrote the diary. They have the answers to the questions that perplexed him, or can find them without difficulty. Remembering this, one cannot help being struck by the penetration and soundness of his judgments on contemporary affairs. The figure that dominates the diary is that of Adolf Hitler, whose thought and intentions were still widely unknown when Scheirer began to write. Mein Kampf, the best source of information on these things, did not yet exist in a good English or French translation at the time Scheirer wrote. There was still a tendency, moreover, among those whom Scheirer calls visiting butter and egg men and some members of the press, to underestimate the German leader or even to regard him as a figure of fun. Intent on correcting this dangerous impression, Shirer from the beginning took Hitler with utmost seriousness, seeing him as a tactician of great skill and a master of dissimulation. He was fascinated by the consistency of the Führer's policy from the so-called Saturday Surprises onward, and as early as 1937 was convinced that he was bent on dominating Europe. Nor was there any doubt in Shirer's mind that the German people would follow their leader wherever he led them. It was true that many Germans disliked some features of Nazism, and that they were tired of rationing and the constant forced contributions for winter aid and the like. The attacks on the Jews also were never popular, although resistance to them was always muted. But none of this diminished the pride that Germans as a whole took in Hitler's undoubted accomplishment in the field of economic growth and foreign policy. Germany might not have been greatly liked abroad, but it had gained universal respect, and most Germans attributed that to Hitler. This popular support was part of what Shira called the dynamics of the National Socialist Movement. He admits that when he first saw Hitler at the Nuremberg Party rally of 1934, for the life of me I could not quite comprehend what hidden springs he undoubtedly loosed in the hysterical mob which was greeting him.